Hello everyone and welcome again back to Arctic Seminar. Our next speaker, Jarno Niemela, comes from FSEQ, that you probably all know, and he's going to talk about cyber espionage. Welcome, Jarno. Thank you. And uh, just a brief, brief note before the presentation. I tend to be absent Monday after presentation, but I raided our marketing store and we have VIP cards containing F-Secure Total, which is the endpoint protection and VPN for five devices for one year. So if you have an interest, come, uh, come here in the front and get, a, get, a, get, a, get your card at the end of the presentation. So anyway, I'm here to talk about cyber. And first of all, what is cyber? So basically, when we are talking about cyber in general, in the way we see it in Helsinki and other magazines, that's cyber attacks. And those are attacks against computerized systems, which have some kind of a real world effect. And these kind of attacks happen for pretty much everything. Medical systems, farm automation. Here is an, one colleague from a different company who was uh, had to deal with a cow heat monitoring system that had been taken over and was doing a denial service attacks. And then, of course, industry automation, trains, water cleaning system, everything is computerized nowadays. And the reason why we have everything computerized, because it's cheaper than discrete electronics, and these guys don't really understand much about computers. So, for example, this system was completely open to internet uh, using VNC connection without authentication. And then, of course, it doesn't really help even if you have a protected systems, if you have a significant attacker. Like there have been the cases when Russians have decided to switch off the electricity from parts of the Ukraine. And this actually was rather complicated attack, so it's not always as easy as finding something from the internet and logging into it. So we also have adversaries with significant capabilities. But anyway, basically now we are focusing on cyber espionage and cyber sabotage. So cyber espionage means that you infil the attacker infiltrates a company and steal something from the company. Ideally so that the victim never realizes that the information is stolen. It can be political or it can be for purely commercial gain in helping uh, the industry in your home country. Or then it can be sabotage, so basically breaking into the system, just like for espionage, but in this case searching for some kind of a control system that can affect and give a real world effect. For Ukraine, blackouts were already mentioned, but then again, also USA has been doing this. For example, the attack, uh, attack against Iranian nuclear research facility, that was a cyber attack. And then there has been one steel mill where an explosion was caused by a cyber operation. Probably somebody was testing their new fancy weapons and found an easy, easy target to see whether they could cause some real world effect or not. But anyway, when we are talking about an attack, there are certain stages that the attacker needs to do. The first thing is the attacker does reckon. He needs to find victims in, in a company to hit. Hacking a server is very rare. Usually the attacks happen by finding victims, finding enough information about victims so that they can be contact, contacted, typically over email. And that means that there needs to be an enough information about the victim to make the initial contact look credible. Everybody nowadays deals with spam, but when it is personalized for you, it is very difficult to distinguish that from the attack. So, attacker tries until he finds a victim who uh, opens the email and clicks a document, or then there is a, simply a link on the document, on the, on the mail, and the, attacker, uh, and the victim goes to attacker's watering hole server, and from there uh, the system is exploited, and attacker is going to get a command and control uh, over the machine. After this, the attacker delivers further components that he needs in order to go further in the environment. So taking over one computer is not enough. It's very likely that this computer is some office worker, doesn't contain anything interesting. 
So the attacker moves from computer to computer, and then until he finds a computer which has significant access to whatever he wants to do, whether that is a factory control system, whether it is uh, uh, for some kind of a database the company has. Anyway, the attacker is able to access the valuables, and then he either sabotages or collects information, and then he needs to exfiltrate that. So as collecting it inside the company is of enough, he needs to be able to steal those in order to get access to those. So that means that he is once again moving the data, first on the machine that had an access, but that's far too valuable the risk for exfiltration. So he's moving it further from that machine into another machine that can be sacrificed for data sending in case uh, the co victim company uh, realizes that something is going on. And then the data is exfiltrated to uh, some data exfiltration point, which is once again throw away. So the attacker will try to avoid detection as much as possible. But so, all of that makes an enemy feel like this. Ch a superhuman always succeeds, undefeatable. Well, this is not exactly the reality. Our enemies more, look more, 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 much, much more like this. There are cases where they succeed 100%, but there are also many cases where the attackers do mistakes and defenders will be able to catch on on them. So, what all this means in practice? Just like a regular malware, the spy, the thing that the spy really needs in order to succeed is to get a piece of code running in the victim systems. All of this is only about getting a code execution in victim system. First on one system, and then from there into another system, so proceeding by computer by computer. But technically we are all talking about code execution, being able to execute code on some machine and using that then to take that machine under control. So, he ne the attacker needs to be able to infect at least one device. And after he has been able to take that machine over, then he needs to uh, escalate his privileges so that he can steal uh, further credentials to be used to move within the environment. This can be either the domain admin credentials or if the company's networks are done stupidly, getting the local admin is enough if the company is using the same local admin credentials on every machine. And this is very, very typical. So, but anyway, this is, doesn't really differ that much from a typical hacking. So many of the things that the, co uh, the spies do, even from the governmental level, are still the same things your regular penetration testers and your regular computer criminals do. So, and that mostly is because they don't need to be more complicated than that. Other thing that the attackers are dependent on is common and control access. So they need to be able to direct the attack. There have been very, very few cases where a complicated attack has been done without having a remote control on that. The Stuxnet incident was one of those, but it was obvious that they had some way of observing the network. And the way they were using to observe has never been found out. So we only found the weapon, we didn't find the observation method. And then, of course, there is a difference between your governmental spy and your garden variety criminal. And there are basically two significant differences. First of all, spy has a lot more resources. They have zero-day exploits and they have advanced attack tools. For example, the kind of tools we have found out uh, from uh, NSA when the Shadow Brokers Hacker Group, which actually is a part of Russian intelligence, broke into one of their systems and leaked the tools outward. This actually led to fun things like WannaCry when the criminals started to use those attack tools. But the even more significant difference between a spy and a criminal is that spy is a government employee. And if, if something, government employees are patient. And there's nothing more dangerous than a patient enemy. So, 
Anyway, when we are talking this about the defender's point of view, when you prepare for governmental espionage or commercial espionage, you are obviously well protected also against common criminals. So, as mentioned, attacker is not superhuman and he does need certain resources in order to succeed. The first thing is that he needs to be able to contact the victim. If he cannot get some kind of connection to the victim, there cannot be no attack. Every single attack requires some kind of connection. Second, he needs to be able to take over something in victim system, be that Microsoft Word, so text processor, be that PDF reader, email reader, maybe router or something else, but he needs to be able to take over something. If he cannot get anything under his control, he cannot proceed. And then when he has taken over something, he needs to be able to move onwards from that. For example, if he has taken over Word, he needs to get away from there before victim closes that particular instance of Word. Otherwise, the attacker's connection uh, disappears. And then he needs to be able to get more privileges on that system. And then he needs to have a command and control in order to direct his attack. And then he needs to be able to move laterally. And then, and then he finally has everything. So let's have a look. What is this contact about? In order to make a contact, he needs to know something about victim. As already mentioned, so attacks start by social engineering. Attacker needs to know the victim in order to be credible for the victim. Names, email addresses, positions, interests, etc. Some kind of framework, some kind of pretext that he is going to use to connecting the victim. And this is basically done by, this basically is needed because most people are in some level of aware of the attacks and thus you really need to be credible. Of course, nowadays people tell enormous amount, amount of things about themselves. So that means that the attackers are going to use in OSINT, open source intelligence. That is looking what you have written in Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, etc. And by this they profile you. And by that, they can uh, become credible in order be, uh, to contact you. They know your hobbies, they know your interest, they know your work position. And if you are not careful, you leak enough information that they might be able, even able to fake credible looking business mail. This is something that you need to be aware. Everybody is nowadays in a social media and me telling you don't go to social media would be stupid. But you need to be aware of what you have written there and then if somebody is using something like what you have written in the social media as a pretext of contacting you, that's when the alarm bells need to go on. So, now the attacker has been able to get connection to the victim. He has been able to get victim to trust himself at least on some level. So that means that now we are going to get the attack. The most simple attack, as already mentioned, is attack over email. So victim gets an email, which contains a document. Document is from known sender and the content is what could be expected. And in many cases, it actually might be a stolen business mail on some, on, from some victim's associates or maybe it is a confer uh, uh, and for example, it might be a conference agenda or something else. It looks like a real mail and it in a way is a real mail except that it contains a macro or exploit and a malicious payload. And here are some examples of the kind of pretexts used in real espionage cases. So these ones are targeting uh, victims who have political or then uh, uh, military interests happening around in Georgia or in those areas. So we don't know who's the attacker. Of course, it's easy to say Russia. It's always Russia when it's not China or USA. But the thing really is that uh, you can see a lot about the intended victims on the kind of content that has been used for attacks. But sometimes the attackers are throwing you a curveball. 
This is related on espionage operation where victim was a member of a group where they sent a lot of jokes to each other. This is a monkey, monkeys act, uh, working in an office. And obviously, this one also contained an exploit. But it was basically using the fact that these guys are sending all kinds of jokes for, uh, between each other, and that was being used as a lure for somebody opening that uh, movie file, which then took over a VLC player. So it's not always word. Remember that VLC also contains exploits, and it's not a far-fetched uh, that somebody might be using VLC player in order to play movies. <coughs> so, but anyway, when victim clicks on a document, what happens next is relatively simple. First of all, the original document that victim receives either contains a macro which the user needs to enable and there's some kind of social engineering for example in order to print this you need to uh, you need to enable uh, enable all functions or they might be say claiming that this document is encrypted in order for it to automatically decrypt please click enable all features but the basically user is already trusting and he will very likely will click enable macros or then again, the other option is that you will have an actual exploit, in which case further user interaction is not needed. After that, the document reader, for example, Word, is taken over. And then the attacker drops, for ex needs to move away from there. He drops and payload, payload DXE to some location and executes that. Or the other option is that he launches some Windows script. So basically uses clean Windows component in order to proceed further in a com uh, computer. The most typical clean components being used are PowerShell, C script, and VW script. C script runs J script, and VW script runs Visual Basic scripts. And these are, of course, clean Windows components. And this is something that nowadays is being used by a lot by normal criminals, but it was started by state level operators. Or then the other option is that the attacker injects directly into another process. For example, 1DL32 is very often used because it has very wide range of behavior and it's very difficult to find out whether, when 1DL32 has been taken over. And then at the, at the same time, the user is still getting the document he was expecting. Either the document reader is able to show the document and take the computer over at the same time. Or the other option is that if Word needs to crash, what happens is that the payload that was able to escape on the system writes another document file without an exploit to the disk that contains the content that the user was expecting. So he is actually seeing the document that he was expecting to see. And that's why this thing works, because user doesn't really see anything. What you might notice is that word flickers momentarily, and then the system is taken over. And then the payload is free to continue in the background. Then other way of uh, attacking a victim is then using a rec exploit. So the attacker infects and victim def uh, vic uh, infects uh, is trying to infect a victim device with a custom zero-day exploit. But this is coming over the web browser, so he simply cannot sell the exploit to the web browser. He needs to get victim to visit the page. He might be sending a link over email, or then he is trusting that the victim is going to a certain web page that he is able to take over and place the exploit waiting there for the victim. And this technique is called watering hole. So these have been done, for example, subcontractors and suppliers. By the way, these are at actual websites uh, that ha have been used for corporate espionage attacks. And then it has been used with governmental services, political discussion groups, news, forums, and also development portal. For example, Apple and Facebook were attacked of an iPhone development uh, forum. So third-party forum where iPhone, iPhone and iOS developers were discussing was taken over 
And then, of course, people from Apple are in there. And then people from companies like Twitter and Facebook were in there. Another interesting thing was that the operating system targeted this targeting. You, uh, you ta operating system targeted by this attack was Mac. It was not Windows. They were targeting a Java vulnerability in Mac in order to take over computers at Facebook, Twitter, and Apple. Or oh, then again, the other way that the attacker might get a watering hole effect is that he doesn't need to compromise a certain website. What he needs to compromise is an advertising broker. And this is called malvertising. So he compromises a company selling advertisement and then uses the profiling database of this particular advertiser in order to fine tune that his adver advertisement is uh, shown to victims that he wants to hit. For example, in here, we are using searches that, first of all, we are interested only on users where the location information is in Blacknack, France. And they have previously been visiting Patria Aero structures. And then they have been previously interested about non-ITAR pressure monitors, which are used in airplanes. Non-ITAR means that it's approved for civilian use, not military use only. Can anybody take a guess what might be the target company? It's Airbus. So three searches, and you can target uh, people working on a certain company, and more importantly, people working on R and uh, aerod aeronautical R&D in that particular company. So, when we, when we are talking about browser attack, it works very much similarly to document attack. So, the uh, browser is taken over, but in this case, the difference is that there is a compromised web page, and this original web page will not take user's computer over because that might be discovered too easily. And, being, and having a control over a web page is very valuable for the attacker, especially if it's a political group or something else. You don't want that to get discovered. So what happens is that the initial compromised web page is giving you a redirect. And that redirect is then redirecting you further until you get into a server that does the actual attack. And this is done in order to hide traces so that the defenders wouldn't be able to figure out where the attack was coming originally. So, and after that, of course, when the victim is finally on the uh, actual attack server called Exploit Kit, it will analyze the user's web browser, check the version, and then select suitable exploit in order to hit the victim. And after that, the web browser is actually taken over and, at, and from here, it continues pretty much the same as document exploit. But the key difference in web attacks is this. In here, we have an initial compromised website. Then, that goes to some redirector. The redirector is completely meaningless, throw away, can be replaced once per five minutes. And then that goes into the actual attack site. And this is also is totally meaningless. Sometimes this chain can continue even longer, depending on how, how, how sure the attacker wants to be, that he, his initial point of entry is difficult to trace. Of course, not always the attacker, the user's browser might not be vulnerable at all, or the attacker doesn't want to risk a valuable exploit. So there are other ways of doing this. So basically fooling user to install an update, telling your Flash player is outdated and please install a new version of Flash player and take in the computer and then that of obviously it's not, a, it's not a Flash player and takes over the computer. And actually there was, was it on yesterday or day before, there was an Android attack campaign, not, go not governmental espionage or common criminals that we're using exactly the same tactic, telling users that you need to update your Flash player, and when you update it, well, your, uh, your phone got taken over. Well, then, the other option is that you actually show a login page 
and hope that the user will log in and enter his password. Or if, if the user is using a password manager, then you show a fake pop-up telling that you need to log into your password manager and then be able to steal all the passwords from the password manager. But then they, when we are talking about governmental atta uh, attackers, they also very often have traffic injection capabilities. So this means that the attacker gets a man in the middle access to the traffic. So that means that he has a way of taking over your network connection and inject reading that your network traffic and injecting content into your network traffic. This could be done either by hacking a router or then if, if you are in the attacker's country, then they can use legal interception. So basically force the ISP to route your traffic through their computers. Or then other option is that if you have an open Wi-Fi like here in assembly, attacker can use evil twin attack. For example, a pineapple, uh, pineapple Wi-Fi available uh, e easily online, which will create a fake version of a Wi-Fi with exactly the same name and more, str more powerful signal. And by Wi-Fi standard, your phones and laptops will always connect to the Wi-Fi access point that has mo most powerful signal. That's the way we can uh, cover all the, uh, everything here in assembly with the same Wi-Fi SSID. And then, of course, there are other tricks that governments can do, like the China's Great Cannon, which is that they have, you know, the Chinese Great Firewall, which inspects and blocks all the traffic coming in and out of China. But they also can do traffic injection. So this, ha and that means that any connection to China can be intercepted by Chinese government and they can in enter whatever they want in there if the, if the connection is not provided by at, least by, by at least by SSL. And then with the man in the middle capability, the attacker can do interesting things like in in inserting exploits into any web page. No matter what web page you visit, as long as it's not protected by SSL, the attacker can autom automatically inject the exploit in there. Very special version only for you, my friend. Or then again, he can do on-the-fly trojanizing or software updates or other executables. Let's say that you're downloading a new version of Firefox. That new version of Firefox could be modified on the fly to contain a trojan. And if it's not uh, signed, then that goes straight through. Of course, Firefox is now signed, but that only happened after a certain corporate espionage incident. And there are many other, especially hardware vendor related auto update software. Dell, for example, has been caught of using unsigned updates. Asus has been caught using unsigned updates, but they are sponsor here, so I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna blast more of them. But anyway, there are many, many vendors, you know, that software auto update themselves. In many cases, there is no verification has the update that they are downloading and installing been tampered or not. And then, of course, what the Chinese did was that they injected JavaScript in the people's web pages who were visiting Chinese servers and those, con and those con uh, made the computers in the denial distributed denial service slaves. So they were able to launch distributed denial service attacks on uh, users who are all around the world and happen to visit some Chinese site. For example, going to AliExpress or something else. Then that's not all. So far we have been talking about something that based on a file, for example, document or web traffic. You can also do attacks by USB. So you can send a victim a USB stick or leave it somewhere where the victim finds it and is curious enough to plug it in into his computer. And what happens after that is that either the memory stick actually is not only a memory stick. It can be multiple devices by USB standard. It can become into a keyboard and type in attack straight over the keyboard. Or it can become a network card and for example sniff your authentication hashes directly over the, e uh, over the Ethernet connection. 
or, or then it can con only contain a file. In here, we have a file called uh, file.scr. Some might remember SCR extension. That's the, that's the extension used by Windows screen savers. It's, but it's the same thing as an exe. It could be as a file.exe. Would any of you click into that? Of course not. Let's give it a PDF icon. Does it now look credible? Nah, still no. Then how about this? Okay. We, in here we have long string followed by gibberish. Well, this looks gibberish, doesn't look credible. But then if we say that this is actually in Israel or any other language that is using left to right writing instead of right to left. So we are using Unicode trick called left to right override. And the end result is this. It is still .scr file, which means that it is an exe. But it, it's here in the beginning because we are inverting the text. And that PDF is actually, from the machine point of view, in the beginning of the file as an FTP. And this is a way how you can use operating system, uh, operating system capabilities and Unicode trickery to make something look a lot more trustworthy than it actually is. But I've so far been talking about attacks that are reliant on user doing something, inserting USB stick, opening a document, using a web browser. What about traditional hacking? Traditional network hacking is nowadays actually pretty rare, thanks to every operating system coming with the firewall and systems being generally up to date. Except if you are NSA, CIA, or any other intelligence agency, or otherwise happen to have an access to very powerful zero-day exploits. Good example of this was the MS-7101, also known as Eternal Blue, which was where the WannaCry worm was based on, that was also in Finnish news a couple months ago. This exploit was used by NSA, stolen by shadow brokers and leaked to internet. Obviously, before it was leaked, it has been used in multiple espionage operations. So we don't really know how many years this has been one of the NSA's tools of the trade on getting an access to Windows 7, Windows XP and other, compu and, and other computers. So what you can do to prem uh, protect yourself against that, uh, this kind of attacks. The, f the best and the easiest protection is to use endpoint protection software that has an exploit countermeasure. For example, F-Secure, but many other highly rated vendors also are able to deal exploits generically. So the idea is that you're not using an AV scan engine. Antivirus is dead. But endpoint protection is a lot more, and what it can do, it can recognize that, hey, this application is behaving in a way it shouldn't, and then shut down that application. But there are also other ways, which is cutting down your attack surface. So you disable everything, for example, for your web browser that you don't need. Don't run Flash. Don't run Java. If you really need it, for example, for bank or something else, you allow it for that site specifically, and for nothing else. So this cuts down the attack surface significantly. Other thing is that you also should do the same thing for the PDF readers, document readers, etc. They contain a lot of capabilities nobody uses. For example, PDFs can run JavaScript. PDFs can run Flash movies. Has anybody ever been playing Flash from a PDF file? But it still has the capability. You don't need it, disable it. But then there are other ways for attackers to get in, and that's physical penetration. So there might be targets that cannot be reached over network or email, and what the attacker will do is that he needs to get physically in the company and, and hack a system 
or simply add a device to the network. In here, we have devices that are modified power supplies and modified UPS devices. For example, this, how often do you see a power supply that has an Ethernet port on the other direction? But then again, if this is somewhere under your desk, you might not notice that. So, the way to get in is maybe simply tailgating, so walking in after somebody in the company, very effective. Or then the other way is bypassing uh, access controls. This is, for example, what F-Secure su uh, security auditors, so we also have penetration testers, so people who break into companies as an assignment and then report how they got in. And one of our basic methods is that we clone RFID access tokens. For example, ones like in here. So there might be somebody from F-Secure outside your company smoking a cigarette, having a long sleeve, and he actually has an RFID antenna here in the sleeve. And when you walk past, he can clone your RFID tag, and then when he needs to go in, he simply replaces that, and he can, he's able to open the door. And then, of course, you can also clone keys, and if somebody is using fingerprint as an access control, also fingerprints can be cloned. And good verified advice, don't use fingerprint for anything, especially for phone authentication. If you want to use a fast way of getting into the phone, use this. You are not leaving marks from joints anywhere. And at least iPhone and high, level and high quality Android phone fingerprint readers are good enough to use this as a unique marker. Or you could use your nose, but that looks a bit silly. So then, of, of course, for special targets, they actually might be needed and a uh, way of physically breaking in. But then, talking about breaking in, you don't need to attack the victim when the victim is at the company. What you can also do is to attack the victim in the hotel rooms. So people are traveling with their devices, and they are, for example, leaving the device in the room when they are going for breakfast. So what, what might happen to your laptop when you are at breakfast? There might be things like this. An attacker using a special Slim Jim to reach your door handle from the other side of the room and opening the door. And hotel doors, by fire safety standards, have to be always openable when you open the handle. No matter if you put, if you lock it, it still will open automatically without any kind of a key when you are uh, turning the handle from inside the room. And this is the way to get into a locked hotel room. Fortunately, there is a simple trick for that. Take a hotel towel and roll that tightly against the handle and then using a Slim Jim becomes a quite, quite a lot more difficult. But then again, you might be wanting to put your uh, laptop into a hotel safe. After all, it's a safe, and it must be safe there. But unfortunately, uh, laptop safes, uh, 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 the hotel safes are not really safe. They can be opened with a high-tech tool called a potato. So in here, we are taking a potato, and we are applying the potato, and now the safe door is open. This is how high quality your typical hotel safe is. Of course, you can use a rubber mallet, but potato is much more fun. Oh, the other option is that if you have just locked your hotel safe, then with a thermal camera, like you can get nowadays for iPhone and Android phones, you can still see which bot buttons have been pressed up to multiple minutes. Yeah, you don't know the combination, but you have pretty good idea which keys have been used. So, after, if you ever need to use a keypad where you might be, uh, might be afraid that somebody might be using a terminal camera, use a pen when tapping the keys. So, now the attacker is in, in the system. 
The next thing he needs to do is to migrate in the system. So basically, the typical way is once again is dropping an exe, or then using one of the built-in capabilities of Windows. So how you can protect against migration? Once again, good quality endpoint protection software will carry you very far. So use a high quality endpoint protection, but there's also other ways. And also you, can make, you need to make sure that your endpoint protection can detect creation of anonymous EXEs and other executable files. Then for Microsoft, you have a tool called Microsoft EMET, which has been designed to protect against exploits, but it also is very capable against process injections. These capabilities work on Windows 7 and earlier versions of Windows 10. Now with the creator's update, these are getting built in, available on all my, uh, Windows 10 users, which means that the attackers will have to circumvent them. That's how it goes. Whenever a protection method is available everywhere, the attackers will be bypassing that. So, the next thing that attacker needs to do is to escalate his privileges and get on onwards on the system. Um, and basically, there are two different things on the privilege escalation. The first is getting from normal user into system level, and then trying to get local or domain admin credentials. The local system can be done either finding a weakness in the operating system itself, code execution exploit on some component, or finding a privileged process with weak permissions. This could be, for example, third-party driver. Drivers, once again, made by third-party vendors are notoriously very badly done from security point of view. For example, graphic card drivers, the vendor is interested in making those fast. Or then you can find a way of sideloading a DLL module so that instead of the uh, DLL component was supposed to, it will run attacker's code. Other option is finding a vulnerability in software installation or patching process. So basically, finding a way of an auto-update or software install, and then the attacker is going to replace his executable instead of the actual executable in the, in the correct moment. And then I have a couple, uh, couple more of these pages, but unfortunately, I was planning my presentation for one hour and I have 45 minutes. So basically what you can do as a company to protect against this. The first thing of course is that there is no single solution. So we are at FCQ are calling, we're talking about predict, prevent, detect, respond. First you need to understand the threats. Then you need to try to stop the threats whenever possible. For example, using the methods I have been describing before. But in addition of that, you need to monitor your network and monitor your systems in case attacker gets through. And after that, you need to respond and kick the attacker out. And this is pretty much an endless cycle. The attackers, attackers will not stop, and that keeps your security people busy and employed. But what you can do as a consumer, because of, your, of course you don't have a security department. So first of all, the most important thing is stay safe. Always run the latest version of the operating system. The operating system vendor doesn't care, the, uh, care about earlier versions nearly as much as the latest version. And do install endpoint security. But in addition of that, do make sure that the auto updates in your operating system are installed and also in your applications. You need to update them to fix the security vulnerabilities. And of course, don't buy devices from vendors that don't provide updates unless you are aware that it is a security risk. For example, for my kids, they don't have credit cards and their usage is limited, so I don't care nearly as much as for corporate systems. So for those, I can buy cheap, cheap Chinese Android phones, but then for the corporations, it's an uh, top-of-the-line Android or iPhones, nothing else. And then, of course, make backups. High-quality protection software 
can protect you against ransomware 99.9999 cases, but not always. So always make sure you have backups. And do secure IoT. IoT devices are right now the worst when it comes to security. The fact is that the vendor doesn't care anything about security with a couple notable exceptions. Funnily enough, IKEA has one of the best IoT security implementations we have seen for, uh, for quite a while, so they do care about their brand. And don't trust public Wi-Fi. When you are in public Wi-Fi, then always use VPN to protect your traffic. So, I thank you for your attention, and I hope you have questions, and at the end, if you're interested, we have these uh, license cards available. So I think we have time for one or two questions. Any questions from our lovely audience? It may be more of a personal opinion <coughs> question, but do you have any recommendations as to what to look for in a VPN? Uh, there are some independent reviews. It's easy for me to say because FCQ has been doing well on those. But I think the country where the VPN comes from matters a lot. And then, in addition of that, type in the name of the VPN and search for news. Have they made any embarrassing mistakes? Has anybody made a review after, out of that? So simply search what do you know about the company, what do you know about the product, what others have been saying, just like buying any other software. Any other questions? Hello, and thank for the presentation. Uh, it was quite interesting. Uh, this is kind of also a personal preference, but uh, if I want to stay ahead of the curve on cyber security and informa information security matters, what are the news forums that I should uh, consider reading almost daily? Actually, we use Twitter a lot among InfoSec profession. So when somebody finds something interesting, they put that into a tweet. Let's say, follow people like Mikko Hyppönen. He's very active. And then when Mikko retweets something, start following that person. And pretty soon, you are in a network where there's more news than you can handle. So, easy word. Follow Mikko and then pay attention to people he is, he is retweeting about. Thank you for the lovely questions and thank you Jarno uh, for thank your you. presentation.